Hello everyone. This is the astronomy video for week seven, which means it is chapter six. Uh, and chapter six is about telescopes and observing. How do we take light and turn it into data? How do we know stuff about the universe? Um, and obviously, uh, an appropriate image is here for you about telescopes. They don't all look like the ones you buy in the store, assuming you buy telescopes in the store. They don't all look like the image you have of a tube with lenses at the end. This is uh, a set of telescopes for radio waves as opposed to visible light. Um, but we start with light, and we start with how the eye works. Right? And that's kind of a fairly important bit. Um, it's a little... Uh, no, don't do that. Uh, it's a little unusual when we talk about, uh, you know, things. We, you have to remember that we're starting out with naked eye observations, and then we're building tools that let us effectively do that better. You know, different wavelengths, more light, that sort of stuff. So how does how do we make the observations in the first place? Well, here's the structure of the eye. There's a lens, um, and there's a pupil. The pupil constricts the amount of light that can come in. The lens focuses the light onto the retina. The retina turns that light into data, in a sense, and sends it to our brain, and we see what we see. All right. If you want greater details than this, take the anatomy class. Talk to Miss Phillips. Um, but the gist of it is. We're using lenses to focus light, and we're using the pupil to govern how much light can get in. Um, and the lens works by what's called refraction, is that light bends when it passes into a new material, when it goes from air to the, when it goes from air to water, or when it goes from air to glass, or to the material in your eyes, lens, it bends. And that allows focusing to occur. Right. Um, we already know that light bends because um, we can see the effect of it. Um, this picture is taken after the sun has already set. The entirety of the sun is below the horizon. However, the light comes through the atmosphere and bends, and so the image of the sun is still above the horizon. You generally, the amount that it bends is such that when the very bottom of the sun touches the horizon, it's already below the horizon. And so the image distorts. And you, you know, you also, because it lies coming through in several different paths, and that's why you see distortion. But that's an example of refraction. Light goes from the vacuum of space into air and bends a little bit. And the more dense the air is, the more it will bend because, you know, that the, how, how much air there is governs how much it bends. So, generally, we treat light from faraway sources, like from a planet or a star. Uh, we treat it as essentially parallel rays of light coming into us. Uh, and refraction will cause parallel rays to converge if you have something that's lens shaped. It's kind of this thin convex shape. You'll get something that focuses. Um, and so picking up that image, you know, you can project it on a screen or it can be in your eye. The retina can, can capture the image or you can do something which is very common in modern astronomy is have a sensor that collects the light of that focused image. You know, this is how a camera works, is there's a small, what's called a charge-coupled device that senses when the light hits it. And, you know, effectively the stuff that's in your digital camera, it's in your phone's camera, works like the stuff that's in a telescope. Um, the old version of this is to have film, obviously. And so you'd have a sheet of film. It'd be like projecting an image onto 
uh, a projection screen and it would interact chemically with the film and record or you'd have chemicals laid on a glass plate and the light would interact with the chemicals and leave an image and so a lot of the historical stuff is on film or on glass plate but nowadays it's all done by digital uh, capturing of the image once we capture it, we can process it, right? This is a picture of Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, famous in 2001, uh, the movie. You know, go watch that sometime. Not now, but sometime. Um, anyway, the, the particulars of this is it looks kind of just like a rock if you look at it with a normal telescope. But because we can refine the image, we can take multiple images and add them together. We can sharpen in the image. We can see some detail, and one of the details we can see, we can also color correct for. We can highlight what's going on and show that there's a plume of ice, of water, coming off the surface. Effectively, it's like a volcano. A uh, volcano spit out molten rock. Well, on, on this moon, it spits out water and in the form of ice and slush. And so it's volcanically active. We'll study that in a couple of chapters. But the key sort of thing is when you see an image in you know popular astronomy, you have to realize that it's probably been color corrected. The image is not going to appear the way you necessarily would see it with your eye. All right, so what limits you from seeing, st like, why can't we go and look at the sky and see one of these great big Hubble telescope pictures? Well, because our eyes are tiny, right? It, effectively, the Hubble is getting a massive amount of light coming in compared to our eye. The key sort of things with a telescope is how much light can it collect? Can you just make a bigger and bigger and bigger telescope and just collect more and more light? And how sharp of an image can it make? How much can we resolve detail? So um, the light collecting area is pretty straightforward. We assume that the opening circular, and so the area is pi times the radius squared. Um, on Earth, now, even in space, I guess, but in general, the largest telescopes we deal with are about 10 meters for light collecting telescopes for visible light. Um, now, angular resolution, this is giving you the idea is how far away can a thing be and we'd still distinguish it as two separate things, like headlights on a, a car driving down the road, is if you can see it from far enough away that they're two different headlights then you can you have a, a larger angular resolution. Right. So these are kind of the important bits. Telescopes limit you, right? Is eventually you, you can try to improve the angular resolution as much as you want, but eventually you get to a point where light interferes with itself. Is you have two sources of light and the sources of light are less than a wavelength part, you'll get that the light overlaps and you'll see interference fringes. You can see here, this is where we've got a puddle of water and we've put two drops and the waves have rippled outwards. And you can see where the waves are overlapping and interfering from the two different sources. And so light does this. And you've seen light interference when we talked about taking uh, a spectrum of light by, you know, in this case, by using um, a diffraction grating and seeing that the, the different, you know, different paths of the light cause interference. So resolution is limited and a larger telescope can get you closer to that limit. You get a greater resolution because you can get light taking different paths through the telescope. They can be physically further apart and so you have less of this interference. Here is a picture where we actually see that interference 
close up of a star and you can see stars don't generally have rings like this around it. What's happening is we're having trouble distinguishing light coming from the star and it comes from slightly different paths because the star has some shape to it. Right? So it's slightly, you know, the, the you'll, you'll find places where the overlap cancels out the light and places where it uh, constructively interferes instead of destructively. And so you get this ring pattern because it doesn't matter, like if it occurs in one spot, it'll occur at that same distance all around the star because it's a sphere. So that interference, this limit, is what's called the diffraction limit. And it's effectively having to do with the light interacting with matter as it comes through the telescope. So, you notice I've never said anything about magnification here. Um, magnification is a property of the lenses, and we don't necessarily need a large magnification because right, we're not trying to make a huge image necessarily. It helps in some cases, but the most important things to get data is angular resolution and this light collecting area. So how do we build a telescope? Well, there's two sorts. One is make something that looks like the eye that focuses light down so we can have a big tube and collect a bunch of light, and then we'll focus it where we want it. It's a refracting telescope. It uses lenses. The other sort is, well, we can steer light with mirrors. Let's use that. Well, it's a reflecting telescope. And so a refractor is a big tube with lenses. Um, now, I'm not particularly going to suggest you need to know all the different types of telescopes. It wouldn't hurt if you have interest to know how a telescope works. But effectively, big tube, lenses on each end. Or the, they might not be on the end. That what distinguishes the different types. But because the light has to go through the tube, and because it has to go through the lenses, you can only hold the lenses on the edges. Right? You can only hold it so it's captured by the tube. So that gives you a problem. One is to get an appropriate amount of light, it has to be a very large tube. You generally need a very long tube to get to proper angular resolution, and you generally have to use a lot of glass in the lens, a large heavy lens. And there's a few ways to get around this, but in general, most serious academic telescopes are going to be reflecting telescopes, because you can support the mirrors from the bottom, from the surface that doesn't reflect the light, and so you can make a much bigger uh, reflector. And also importantly is when you make a lens, you have to get two surfaces perfect. When you get a mirror, you only have to get one surface perfect, and the surface doesn't have to be uniform. We'll see pictures of where they take multiple mirrors, like a hexagonal pattern of mirrors, and they can you can tune the the perfection of the mirror by tuning the angle at which those segments lie. So most telescopes are reflectors because they're easier to build. You don't need a tube, you just need a mirror and some way of supporting it. Um, and you know, there's some other versions where uh, how do you get the image out? Well, you can take it out the side or you can take it out the bottom or you can use another set of mirrors. The idea is that you use other mirrors to steer where the focus is going to be. But basically the problem is building this big primary mirror, and that's easier to do than building a big lens. So different designs, I don't care if you know this, I just care that you, know, you have some idea of what's going on. Um, here's what I was talking about, segmented mirrors. It's hard to make a big 10 meter piece of glass and make it reflective, but you can make 10 1 meter pieces of glass is easier. Or you can build a machine that will do smaller and smaller chunks, and you can move the chunks around to tune the, the, the perfection of the total mirror. 
So these are particular telescopes that they're trying or have built on a, a mountain in Hawaii, Mauna Kea. I've sent you an article where they're trying to build a new probe. Now, the, the mountain has importance to the people that live there. And you don't necessarily want to build something there unless you have a good reason to. And, you know, as long as you're keeping everyone happy, which is kind of a problem. So there's been a lot of, you know, protests over that, as the article says. What I'm going to get into in talking about these slides is why do we want to build a telescope there in the first place? Right? And why is a lot of telescopes built there already? So what do you do with a telescope? Right, you, you have your fancy telescope and you want to take some data. What do we want to find out? These are the three things. One is going to be taking a nice picture, taking an image, which is the closest to naked eye observation. Um, the other one you've learned about in the previous chapter is finding the spectrum of the light, finding out where the light came from in a sense, or what did it pass through. And the third one is taking many measurements over time and asking how does the light vary with time. All right, so we're going to go through these in some detail because um, you can imagine imaging as taking a picture with your cell phone. You've seen what spectroscopy looks like, right? You had the, um, the spectra activity uh, from the previous week. And you kind of have an idea what time monitoring is. It's like watching TV. You sit there and you watch for a while and you see what happens. Right. So when you talk about imaging, we generally don't take a nice color picture. That's kind of a harder thing to do. What we like to do is filter the light and take measurements at particular wavelengths. So if you want a visible light picture that roughly represents what we would see with the eye. We would take a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. We would use those to measure the intensity of light at those particular wavelengths and then combine them together to make an image. Imaging is generally a construction thing. You construct an image out of sets of data. Um, you know, you can still take a camera and take a picture of a thing. But generally, even if you do that, you know, in backyard astronomy, you're going to want to do filters to, you know, carefully filter out light that you don't want, as well as to get, you know, the intensity of the light that you do want. So you combine stuff to make full color images. Okay. Um, now, the other thing is that Telescopes can see light that we can't see with their eye. So in this case, this is an image that is used, that is taken with an X-ray telescope to investigate basically where the energy sources are in this blob. And detectors can record light that we can't see. So what we can do is map those wavelengths to visible wavelengths to build an image. And that's what we've done here. And the idea is that Blue is generally more energetic photons than red. So we energet we map the highest energy areas, the highest energy x-rays to blue and the lowest energy ones to red. So a lot of the images you might see aren't necessarily actually visible images. They're things we can view at different wavelengths, and the image you see is constructed. It's it's a it's not a real image, but it represents the real data. And so you can see here, this is, um, you know, this is telling you that there's more energetic stuff going on in basically a bubble around the middle of this thing. And behind it is where there's less energetic stuff. All right, so you can use basically you can use the wavelength to determine or give evidence for what's going on in an image. This looks like it might be something that's coming toward the bottom left 
so our bottom right corner, you know, stuff might be interacting in that direction for some reason. All right, we'll figure out what sorts of things might be happening uh, in later chapters, obviously. So spectroscopy, you've seen basically how that works with um, with the lab. The idea is we cause the spectrum to open up with something like a diffraction grating or a prism, something like that. Here, a diffraction grating is a mirror that has cuts in it akin to the piece of plastic that I showed that had cuts in it. Uh, you remember the picture that probably should have showed a rainbow, but it didn't. That's that's what it is. So after it passes through the telescope, you collimate the light. You make all the light go through the grating parallel, and then you focus it down on a sensor. And the idea is that the sensor can scan, and the intensity at a particular point matches the intensity of a particular wavelength. So this has nothing to do with the actual image that you would see, say, here. It, what this does is you get a, a focus bit of light, and that focus bit of light will go and be separated out by color, by wavelength. And so you, you don't get the image you expect in, when you take a, a picture you get the spectrum, and you just measure the intensity of light along that spectrum. Right? So this is what you get out of it, is something that looks like this. And there is such a thing as resolution. It is depends on the, the details of the light coming into you and the details of your spectrometer. Um, you know, Basically, you can't tell a whole lot about this upper image, but the lower image, we can tell that there's very specific, uh, these are, I'm guessing, ultraviolet or x-ray. There are very specific absorptions in those, uh, in this spectra. Which means that this light passed through something that absorbed the UV or the x-rays. So the third thing we can do is time monitoring. The idea is that can we see something that's periodic? Or can we see behavior that we don't expect? Right? And so sometimes it's as simple as going out every night and looking and seeing that the star is the same brightness or that the planet is the same brightness and the same color. Other times is you have to watch an object consistently. Um, and so what we're seeing here is a particular star that dims over time and then suddenly brightens up again. And this is a periodic thing. The period's about 330 days here. So we're looking at this over a period of eight years, and we're seeing several cycles of this brightness. And so you watch an object that can change in brightness. You watch it over a long period of time to see what it what its behavior is over that time. That's what time monitoring is. It's, it's fairly straightforward. You just look, and so you can look at the spectra over time, or you can look at the image over time. Or maybe you're just looking at the relative brightness. Is it getting brighter or dimmer? So we've got a telescope. We're trying to get all of this data. We've got a plan. You say you go out and you have it set up. And what's the number one problem you're going to have? It's cloudy or it's raining. You want to set everything up where you have the best possible opportunity to see what you're intending to see. So the best ground-based sites are places where it's calm with very little atmosphere to see through, so high up, you know, on top of a mountain, where it's far from city lights, where it's very dark, and where it tends to be very dry. So mountains in deserts are very good spots. And mountains in deserts in or near the equator are better spots because you'd like to see more stuff. If you set up a telescope at the pole, you can only see stuff to the north. If it's at the equator, you can see stuff over the whole sky because eventually the Earth will rotate around where you can see it. So light pollution is a big deal. Um, 
if you wanted to do a science fair project for the governor's school and not work with someone else, you're probably going to end up doing a light pollution project. Light pollution is a big deal. You can see this, this is a famous map where someone stitched together all the possible night skies seen by a satellite as it orbited around. Right, so stitching it together, you see some interesting details. All right, where um, where you want to put the telescope is places where it's very dark. So places like the Sahara Desert or Sub-Saharan Africa, the Amazon, um, the middle of Australia is pretty good. The, the uh, western part of China looks good. If you look at America, <laughs> it, it's kind of rough. You might say New Mexico, Arizona. Hawaii doesn't look bad because there's nothing around. Like, there's lots of light there locally, but there's just nothing but water around it anywhere. You can see some other things in this image. Uh, you can see the Korean Peninsula. You can see South Korea and directly above it, North Korea. And a distinct contrast. Uh, Japan is horrible for light pollution, as you can see. You wouldn't want to put a visible light telescope there or an infrared. Europe is covered in lights. Um, India is fairly lit up. You know, lots and lots of people, so lots and lots of lights. Um, you know, in China, on the coast, same thing. Um, but you can basically, what you're looking at is a map population density. Um you can see a few other things. You can see the Nile, because you can see the cities it's formed along the Nile in Egypt. Um, you can maybe make out the Amazon, but it's not quite... Um, it's really hard to make any details out anywhere else that I can see, but you can see a few places. Anyway, you, you want to avoid all this light, and light scattering from our source of light, human-made light, causes problems. Um, and I encourage y'all to look up that we're making this even worse. We're putting stuff in space that reflects light. Um, uh, SpaceX, the private uh, space company, put up satellites that are particularly reflective. And so they sit below the horizon and reflect sunlight into the atmosphere, and we see, sorry, the sun sits below the horizon, but the satellite sits above the horizon and reflects light to us. And so you can see the constellation, you know, if you go out at night, you can see trains of satellites go by, and that gives problems. If you're trying to take an image and you get a bunch of reflections in it, then it ruins the image. Well, there's other problems with ground-based telescopes. Um, all right, here we're looking at the same image. One is through a telescope on the ground, the other is through the Hubble telescope. And what you're noticing is atmospheric effects. Air uh, that's turbulent can have different densities and so different indexes of refraction. And so it will move the light differently as the air changes. All right, if you've went outside and you've seen stars twinkling, that's what's happening, is the air is changing between you and the star. And it distorts the view, and so it looks pretty when you're looking with your eye, but when you're trying to take an image with a telescope, you want to avoid as much air as possible. There is a way around that. Um, I sent you an article about adaptive optics, but the idea is, what if we can figure out how the atmosphere is changing and change the telescope to cancel it out. And the idea is that it compensates for the turbulence in the atmosphere. And there are a couple different ways. You can get a star that you know the details of, that is bright and nearby, and use its uh, twinkling to undo the twinkling of something you want to observe. Um, if you can't do that, you can do things like shine a laser into the atmosphere and see how the reflected light twinkles. But the idea is both of these are letting you get a greater resolution by undoing the effects of the atmosphere. Um, 
But in general, if you can avoid atmosphere, it's the best. And that means you're avoiding light by putting it on a mountain. You're avoiding water in the air by putting it in a desert. And you're also avoiding weather. It's going to be calm. And by being on top of a mountain, you get less, you get more atmosphere below you and less above you. And so common places to put, uh, put telescopes, Hawaii, um, mountainous areas, you know, like uh, the deserts in Chile. Uh, there's a few others. Of course, you also want it to be convenient to you. So there's telescopes in other places. But if you're trying to do a uh, academic research, you try to put it in the best possible place and then you go there and do it. Of course, the obvious thing is just to get above the atmosphere. We put telescopes in space, one, for visible light to get rid of the atmospheric effects. But there's other reasons, too. So this is a picture of Hubble, I believe. One problem is there's a reason why we see visible light. That's because that's the light that is easiest to get to us. Um, this is mapping out the entire spectrum. And it maps out the spectrum by how much absorption we expect. And, you know, we absorb a lot of high energy stuff, which is good, because otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? Chemistry would break down in the atmosphere and we wouldn't have life. And we absorb a lot of infrared and less radio waves, but basically, Visible light can get through to the ground at, you know, strong intensities, and that's what we observe. So to get other forms of light, we need to put the telescopes where they can be observed. And so we can do other tricks. We can put telescopes on airplanes. We can put telescopes in balloons and rockets. But effectively, we have to, for some things, put the telescopes in space. So um, one thing you can do if you happen to have the equipment, um, and it's not too terrible, you can observe radio waves with satellite dish. You put your receiver where the for the satellite dish is, and it will reflect radio waves. So you can do things. Um, this is a fairly common like undergraduate level project is build a radio telescope and observe the sun, observe Jupiter. Those are like close by, easy to find radio sources. But you can build something larger to observe harder to see things. You know, angular resolution works for all wavelengths. You can build a larger radio telescope. Um, here is the, basically the largest one, which recently uh, had a big accident and tore up the dish a bit. Uh, this is Arecibo in Puerto Rico. What they've done is they've built a spherical dish mounted in a sinkhole in the ground. And this thing is a massive, massive, like you can stand under it. It could hold a couple of football fields, something like that. It was a massive place. And then the detector sits above it on suspension lines and can be moved about to steer where you want to uh, to steer to focus so that you can figure out what thing you're looking at. But a radio telescope is basically a giant mirror for radio waves. So it's like aluminum foil. Or uh, if you've seen the big satellite dishes for television, you know, a, a wire grating. But it just reflects radio waves. So there are infrared detectors and ultraviolet detectors. Uh, they're more telescope-like. But what they do is they get above the atmosphere. So infrared ones, uh, sometimes you can fit them on airplanes. And so you can fly the airplane and detect, um, you know, you do your measurements in the airplane. So you can schedule when it's convenient for you. Um, other times you put it in space. Um, they work like visible telescopes, but their detectors are able to see more wavelengths. If you want to see higher energy light, 
you kind of have to construct something special that will allow you to focus the light because this ability to focus that glass has, you know, mirrors and lenses, generally works the best with ultraviolet light and lower. So for x-rays, high energy, they're just not going, they're going to try to go through the object instead of reflect. So for x-ray telescopes and gamma ray telescopes, you want something that will be very grazing incidence for reflections, something that will just barely turn the light a little bit, which means you need to build this big thing to get lots of grazing bounces to cause the focusing. So X-ray telescopes are not like visible light telescopes, though they still focus a lot. And then gamma ray telescopes are the same, but even harder to do. All right, so there's only so big you can build a thing, right? Is we built a massive radio telescope that required us to put it in a sinkhole. Um, if you ever get the chance, you can go to West Virginia. Green Bank uh, has an observatory, and I think there's a ski resort like right over across the mountain from it. Snowshoe, I think. But that is the largest steerable telescope, which means we can turn it around wherever we want and point it. And it's 100 meters across. You know, that's a football field that you steer around. There's only so big we can make a single telescope. But our idea is here is what could we do? Because uh, we're building lots of telescopes. Could we chain them together in some way? And it turns out you can. Um, so we'll talk about interferometry in another context where that context is looking at the interference between light that travels different paths, paths. That's kind of what we're doing here. We have light from a source going to two different telescopes. And by looking at how the light appears going through these two different paths, we can use it to simulate a large telescope the size of the distance between them. And so we can add additional telescopes to get additional Re angular resolution. The idea is, is to simulate having a big telescope with a bunch of small ones, and that gives you better angular resolution. And so this is easy to do with radio telescopes. You just put multiple dishes up um, because effectively when you get the focused light, you're effectively just getting the intensity at the place you're looking the telescope at, at where you're staring at. You're getting one data point. So you can chain a lot of that together. For infrared and visible light telescopes, it's not as simple as building a whole bunch of them. You have to do a bunch of image processing, but you can do it now. And it's, it's getting to be a more common thing is combining several different measurements together to make your, uh, make your observation be better. That concludes the chapter. Um, now, that, I mean, it doesn't perfectly conclude it because I've, you know, sent you a bunch of stuff and this is all about how does light work to give us data? How do we interpret what we're seeing when we look at the sky? How do we turn the light that we pick up with our telescopes into uh, information? And most of astronomy is looking at light. But there is other things that we can do now. This hasn't always been the case. But there is other stuff we can do. So, like I said, there's other things you can do. And some of that stuff has started occurring in a uh, very recent time. Um, so... What's happening when something happens in an object that we're trying to observe is energy is released and comes to us, right? And one way it's released is by, by light. You know, the light 
you know, the object glows in some way or emits light and it comes to us and we see it. But objects can also radiate energy through other sorts of waves. Uh, in particular, if their mass changes in some way, if they change the distribution, the density, you know, how, how the mass is laid out, it can affect, you know, basically the space between us and the object. And so it emits what's called a gravitational wave, which is basically if something were to change about the mass of an object, that information has to come to us somehow, and it has to travel at the speed of light. And so it acts like a wave that propagates towards us. And what's happening is the space between us and the object stretches or contracts. And so we build detectors. What this is is a massive, massive, massive tube with no air in it. In this case, it's four kilometers long in the picture and going across the picture and off the screen. And we shine laser light down the ends of it to basically measure the length of these tubes. And when the, when the gravitational wave hits, it stretches these tubes out very slightly in one direction and compresses them very slightly in the other direction. And so we can measure the very stretching of space as energy comes to us from these objects. So this gravitational wave observing is a new way of observing stuff that it helps us in the sense that we get a new source of data and it gives us data that doesn't uh, doesn't have light involved in it. It's, you know, we don't need light so we can see things that are dark, like black holes. And so you can go look this up on your own. Uh, we will talk about it at a later time when we actually talk about relativity a bit. Um, but we do have other ways of observing. Uh, and we've built several. Uh, the American stuff is what's called LIGO. Um, and we've made two detectors. Uh, one, you know, basically you, you want to be able to steer the telescope in some way. And the way we do that is using the Earth's rotation. So we have two detectors. And that lets us figure out which way we're looking. And they're very far apart, so we don't have, like, vibrations. So we can measure these particular stretches and compressions of, of our detector tubes. So I'll let you all look at that some more. There are some other ones as well. Um, uh, there's, I think, a couple in, uh, you know, there's one in uh, Italy, and there's, uh, one in Germany, and there's one in Japan, um, and, you know, the idea is that the more of these detectors you build, the more stuff you can see. So that concludes the chapter. Um, most of this chapter is going to be on light, obviously. I want you to focus on that. Uh, homework should be on light, but, you know, I was throwing this extra stuff out at the end.